Ayesha, a very good afternoon to those of you that have joined us for this final session of the day. Just a reminder to my panelists that we are streaming live, so we do have an audience beyond the room. And uh, as the introductory video indicated, this session is about the state of natural gas on the African continent and to what extent natural gas can be used to plug the global energy deficits that we're seeing. So I think before we go any further, let me introduce my panelists. Henry Menkiti is the Chief Operating Officer of the Sahara Group. Fola Fagbule is Deputy Director, Head of Financial Advisory at Africa Finance Corporation. And Adli Kafafi is the Vice President Africa and New Ventures at Taka Arabia. Thank you so much for your time. So let's start with the state of natural gas on the African continent. And gentlemen, we know that this is a highly technical, highly emotive subject. So we're gonna try and keep this debate at the surface level and really appropriate for the layperson so that we get a good sense of, of the natural gas environment and to what extent we can unlock natural gas. We saw on the video 600 million Africans don't have access to any type of energy whatsoever. Henry, let me start with you. All right, good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Just wave your hands if you Loud can. Loud and clear. All right, thank you very much. It's an excellent question for an excellent topic. Um, let me just lay the foundations as I think it should be laid. Africa is a gas continent that happened to find oil. A gas continent, and you can quote me, that happened to find oil, which means we were looking for gas or looking for something, we stumbled upon oil. It's expensive to drill wells and evacuate the oil, that is true. But in drilling for oil, there are times you can find gas. Gas associated with oil is wet gas. When I started in oil and gas, when we were looking for oil, or when we were drilling, if we found gas, we were told, avoid it. Every technology at the time was designed to avoid gas. Why? Because you didn't want to go through gas and have the gas leak in some poor kid's school. Avoid gas, it's useless, look for oil. Look for oil because once you extract it, you know the price on the stock market, you will get your returns almost immediately. Gas, however, the assumption is, it has a lot of things like H2S, which is corrosive. You put wells in the ground. You have to have specific types of casing. You have to be sure you have enough of those type of dry gas. You have to look for a market. You have to build special processing facilities to take out anything else, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's very capex intensive compared to oil. So you run the economics, and most people felt oil is easier to find. The world has changed. Of course, we have Russia, Ukraine, and we have supply and demand, and natural gas has now ramped up in price and suddenly becomes a hugely viable opportunity for investors and for profiteers. Let me bring you, Fola, in at this stage. This is a cycle. I mean, supply, demand, economics. We know that generally, the oil price goes up, supply changes, the oil price comes down. And I think that's possibly exactly what's going to happen with natural gas. So all those that are running to deploy capital into the natural gas environment right now, two years down the line, are going to be looking back and thinking, uh oh, CapEx does not match what we're paying for natural gas. Yeah, you know, I think the, the natural gas um, discussion in Africa uh, is now beyond actually just, you know, uh, is it viable or is it feasible? It's, it's become essential to the future of, of the continent. Uh, and it's no longer a side conversation. It is a central conversation. I mean, we at AFC have been uh, investing in uh, natural gas assets and natural gas infrastructure for many years uh, before gas ever became sort of... Uh, on the agenda in the way that it is. Uh, and not just on the agenda from a point of view of an investment opportunity, but also on the agenda from a sustainability perspective, from a decarbonization perspective. It's impossible now to talk about uh, oil and gas anywhere in the world without talking about decarbonization and, and, and sustainability. And certainly in Africa, the, the same is the case. 
Um, Africa has significant uh, natural gas reserves. Africa is a, already a significant contributor to uh, natural gas uh, supplies globally. Um, I do think that as the, the video that we, we watched showed, we need to think about the problem uh, beyond just supplying uh, uh, additional supplies to, to the West, right, to, to meet their, the shortfalls that, that they're dealing with at the moment because we have an energy crisis uh, in Africa. Not only do we have an energy crisis in Africa, we also have an unemployment crisis in, in Africa. Uh, and not only do we have an unemployment crisis in Africa, we have also a fiscal crisis with many of the governments in Africa uh, that absolutely uh, need uh, revenue to, um, to, to meet uh, local needs. So it's a complicated, uh, complex set of challenges that we're dealing with. Gas is an important and fundamental part of the solution. Uh, we recognize that uh, and it is showing up, uh, has shown up historically in our portfolio of investments and increasingly will continue to become a central part of what we're investing in. And looking forward to talking about some of those projects, uh, how we think about those projects and why we're supporting those, those uh, critical gas projects uh, all across the continent. I think that's, that is critical, is that this is very much part of the solution. We use this term, a just transition in emerging markets, and we know that we need a transition fuel. That has to be gas, because we can't just go from oil and coal, skip anything else and go straight to renewables. It's not going to make sense. But we talk about financing costs, and I know we're going to come back, Fola, and see the AFC coming to the table with some uh, cost-effective options here. But Adley, it is very expensive, as we started with Henry, to put the capex in to extract the gas. And of course, whether we deploy it domestically or we deploy it globally, it's capital intensive. The funding right now is not there at a reasonable rate, or am I wrong? Yes, exactly, but I, I want to highlight a small thing. When you're saying it is expensive to put capex, yes, it is expensive, but it is more expensive to utilize other sources for the, for the clean cooking and for the energy required then the capex that you will invest. But the problem that you don't have the access to the finance. Yeah, just, I, I like numbers, so I, will, I, I would like to give you some numbers. Today, let's take an example, Tanzania. The natural gas price in the pipeline is $5 per MMBTU. So while, while the LPG price, okay, that they import to use for cooking, it reached to the final consumer for $25 per MMBTU. So if we invested just an investment, even if it's high, and we paid an additional $5 per MMBTU on the CapEx, but the problem, it is a big investment, but the total cost for the consumer, it will be much more less than utilizing LPG. I hope I, I, I'm not too technical on that. So at the end, the final consumer would utilize its own gas for $10 while, while what they are doing today, we, we do not find uh, uh, funds for reasonable prices to invest in, in the networks and in, in the extraction of natural gas if the gas to be utilized locally. So we have uh, to, to find, and I would like to add two points also to, hi to highlight for if, uh, Yanni, uh, I, I like those numbers, that today Africa, we're around 13, 15% of the population while we, we are responsible of not more than 3% of the carbon dioxide emitted. So we're not the problem. And while we may have other solutions for the renewables as well, today the, 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 the money spent, the investment spent outside or in the renewable energy in general is more than $300 billion. The share of Africa is more, it's not more than 1.5%. So. Well, the numbers make sense, and, and Fuller, you were saying that this is something that the Afri Africa Finance Corporation has been investigating for some time. So give us a sense of the projects that are being deployed at the moment. Yeah, so not only investigating, we have been investing in, uh, both successfully and I should also say unsuccessfully. I think what is happening is that the time is becoming more right for gas uh, as we speak. Uh, there are many factors that, that combine to, to make projects uh, successful. 
Uh, certainly in Nigeria, which is, a, you know, the biggest uh, market from a point of view of consumption uh, of gas as well as from the point of view of, of, of uh, resources. And also flaring. And also flaring, unfortunately. Um, the, the key challenge critically, historically, has been that way too much of the gas resources, the actual reserves, have been in the hands of the state uh, as opposed to in the hands of private owners uh, who are willing to invest the capital to, to develop those projects. Uh, they, they've been in joint ventures between the, states, uh, the state and in international oil companies who, quite frankly, have not had the incentive for many years uh, to exploit, uh, develop, produce uh, those gas resources both for the local market and for international consumption. That being said, many successful projects have happened historically. For example, Nigeria liquefied natural gas is a famous uh, success story that we uh, have been involved in uh, uh, at multiple levels um, that has built multiple trains and that is a major supply of, of liquefied natural gas into, uh, into the West. Uh, Nigeria has also you know, a quite sizable domestic gas market, uh, including uh, pipeline infrastructure, uh, local uh, industrial users um, that are uh, purchasing uh, a lot of that gas and using it to power uh, electricity given the country's uh, but, but it sounds, electricity for challenges. A, having spent quite a lot of time in, in Lagos, it sounds as though Nigeria, your cup certainly is half full when you talk to me about the electricity provision in Nigeria. The reality is we're still sitting with regular blackouts Mm -hmm. The situation has not changed mm -hmm. fundamentally. There are projects, but they are, they're not at scale, are they? Well, the situation has changed, right? And so there have been improvements. And I'll let, uh, uh, I'll let Henry talk uh, when he does to some of those critical improvements uh, in electricity distribution, uh, certainly at the distribution level, some of the most important distribution uh, entities in Nigeria, you've seen improvements in transmission, there's work ongoing in generation, there's also been improvements. But to your original question about, about gas projects, so we're seeing increasingly now floating uh, LNG projects for, for export. Some of the sponsors of those projects are, are here and will be presenting their projects at, at, uh, at this, this event. Uh, we believe those projects have very strong merit and will get to financial close uh, and will increase Nigeria's contribution to uh, export gas to, to meet the needs of the world, but more importantly, Nigeria is also embarking on a major project now of catalyzing local demand, LPG demand for cooking gas, which is going to displace uh, other less sustainable, uh, other less environmentally friendly uh, ways by which very many Nigerians, a significant proportion of the population in Nigeria Well, let's hope that the, the current uh, general election that is heating up does not derail everything. But uh, Henry, you nearly jumped out of your chair when I said that the situation in Nigeria was sounding relatively rosy. You have a totally different view? No, he actually Flood did a great job um, given the perception, or not making the perception a reality. There are improvements. But I want to take up what Fuller has said, which is very true, and I want to add to what I had said to him and go around the continent a bit. You know, I started off by talking about wet gas. A lot of what goes into the LNG train, wet gas implying I drill for oil, I find gas as well. I thank God because I can do something with it if I take out the liquids. Which a lot of our LNG, our in Nigeria, that's where a lot of the gas comes from. It means if I cannot produce that oil, I cannot get gas. I pick Nigeria, for example, and I'll pick some other countries. 200 million plus people. In a few years, 15 years, it will be 300 million people. Let me give you a perspective. 300 million people is the size in population of the United States. Nigeria is the size of Texas. If you can imagine the population of the United States crammed into Texas, that's what he's referring to. So supplying their needs is a challenge, but it's being done. However, if you can't get the oil and therefore gas out of the ground, you can't do anything. Everything we're talking about falls flat. He gave a lovely example of LNG. Today they do well, but they're at 68% capacity because the nation is unable to supply oil and associated gas with the oil consistently. In other words, if you took a graph, it looks like this over time, on a daily basis through a month. It's not sustainable, which means you can't command the premium from an off-taker 
if you can't guarantee consistent production. But let's look around the continent. I take Algeria, I take Egypt, I take Morocco as examples. Going back to your first question. Algeria and Morocco supply via pipelines to Europe, to Italy and Spain, gas. Both countries do the same. Egypt do the same. In fact, there's a three-way agreement between Israel, Egypt to supply the EU. Now, if you look further south of the continent, in Mozambique, I think there's an example given here today where because of the, and we'll get to that, the security challenges in the north of the country, I think Total had to suspend a very large project. However, E and I are doing it offshore, floating LNG. Nigeria is an example that Fuller nicely gave. The final one I want to give is, and most people don't know this, Senegal, Mauritius in the west coast of Africa. They actually are about to put on a large field. I think, again, numbers, if I'm not mistaken, is equivalent to, I think it's about 15 trillion cubic feet. No, more. More. Senegal, three fields, 40 TCF. That is three times the amount that Germany used, sorry, five times the amount Germany consumed in 2019. My point is this, as a continent, who are we supplying? Are we supplying the EU or different countries within the EU? Now you've given us a whole bunch of examples. What are you trying to land with those examples? Because I mean, obviously we have got the supply to Europe we know that we still have a huge energy deficit in Africa. Are you saying, I just want to try and understand the examples. We shut down supply to Europe and supply Africa, or are you saying that we can do everything? Because I've got another thing I'd like to throw at you. What about we get the developed world to fund infrastructure with regards to gas, natural gas extraction, LNG, um, the floating uh, ships that you need to export it. And then we supply them with natural gas that they need so that it's a quid pro quo. Would that work? There you go, Robin. You've solved the problem. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, so, sorry sorry to, to... No, but, but I just... Sorry, sorry, fellow. I just, but I still want to understand what were you saying with those examples so that I'm with you. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, you could apply a socialist solution. We all come together, you produce that, you produce this based on your needs, and we supply it. That's it. All these countries I've mentioned are capitalists. So to enforce a socialist solution on capitalistic societies is going to be difficult. However, there's a need. There's also a domestic need. You mentioned a part of that, where we look at our, and I'm referring to the continent, looks at its domestic needs. It has a teeming population that is massively growing. Nigeria and Angola in particular, Egypt as well. This is a young population that will be demanding change, social so, demands. So I'm still trying to get to... So what, what I'm suggesting is this. For the EU, Africa needs to look at what it can produce today, what it can produce tomorrow with its infrastructure and financial backing today, knowing that there'll be a gap between what Africa can provide and what the EU needs are. Africa still has to meet its own internal needs. It has to. We know this, though. I don't think we're debating this. Right. We know this. So if we know what Africa needs and what Africa can provide, compare with what European needs are, there can be... The so you're gaps coming can back be to, to yes. where I was going. The gaps can be filled, but the EU needs to support that gap. Of course they do. Fola and Adli, I know you've been quiet, but Fola did want to come in here, and then I'm going to hand you the mic for 10 minutes. <laughs> right. I mean, the simple answer is that we have to do both, right? Because we are dealing with a multifaceted crisis, right? You have, we've, we've talked about this already, a population that is growing and that, we, that is energy hungry. Uh, we have the fiscal crisis of most uh, of the government. I mean, one statistic that is out there is 50% of more than 50% of the oil and gas producers in Africa uh, depend on oil and gas for more than 50% of their export earnings, right? So it is essential to all of those countries that have the resource. Uh, to continue to export gas. Uh, the best markets are the export markets. That's the reality, because you can earn uh, foreign exchange uh, in those markets, uh, and those are very ready markets that can, you know, you, you made a point about working with partners to uh, finance the construction of projects that then supply gas. That's exactly how uh, gas projects for export are financed historically, uh, and those offtake agreements are critical 
a critical element of, of financing those projects. So we need to keep doing that. We need to do much more of that. And we certainly at AFC are heavily focused on supporting projects of that nature. But we can't stop there because we also have to take care of the domestic reality. And in some cases, the domestic reality is actually that we need to build LNG import uh, facilities uh, that are bringing liquefied natural gas for importation uh, into, for, and, and we've supported one such project, for example, in, in Ghana, um, that is going to inject uh, liquefied natural gas for regasification and use uh, in the local market, uh, in, in local energy market in Ghana. So we must do both. Uh, we have the resources, thank God for that. Uh, the key thing that we need to do, uh, and, we, uh, and it's happening already in many African countries, we need to become more organized, right? We need to catalyze the domestic market and the ability uh, for the domestic market to pay for, uh, for gas, which is an essential aspect of making projects bankable. And then we need to do multiple more uh, export projects than we've been doing in the past. And I think, Fola, you made the assertion earlier that, that natural gas has suddenly jumped so high on the agenda. Dare I say, Adli, that it's because Europe is now looking for diversified energy supply. Russia has cut them off, and suddenly Africa is the solution. Doesn't that mean that everything is dependent then on the length of the Russia-Ukraine war, and it could all just change? Yes, but I, I, I will take the model of Egypt and Algeria, okay? Last year, or 2022, Egypt exported around $10 billion natural gas, while the local electrification, it is more than 99%. Algeria, the local electrification is more than 95%. I've lived in Algeria for 12 years. And 95% of their export is coming from the oil and gas. So I totally agree with that. But what I don't agree with that Nigeria, the electrification, it's not more than 20% or 25%, while they export all their LNG, or I, would, I wouldn't say all, 70%, 75% of the natural gas is exported. It's not right. It's not right that Mozambique today holding a, a, a natural gas as equivalent as Nigeria and the electrification percentage is not more than 30%. It's not right. Africa should come first. The continent should utilize its local resources and then we export the rest. We shouldn't, we shouldn't wait and, and, and for that we will need funding. But I, I have tried myself to get funding for several projects which, which is in sub-Saharan Africa uh, for, for, for power generation and, and for, and the first thing you ask, okay, we, 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 are, we are okay, we will give you finance for that. Okay, very good. Then what are the guarantees? I said, okay, we, we should have a project financing, so let's try to get a local guarantee for that. No, 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 you should carry the, the guarantee. How, how come, Ashka? You should carry it as, 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 as an investor, you would take it on your balance sheet. Okay, I'm an Egyptian company going to invest in Africa, but I would like to pay my part of the equity, and then I would like to get that on the project itself, because we're gonna help Africa utilize its natural resources locally. They said, no, no, we are very sorry, we cannot give you finance for that, let's try to think, okay, or maybe we can give you, a, 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 and, and then we go for the next step. So, can you give me a local uh, fund? So because I will be selling in the local currency and I cannot take the risk of getting dollars and getting paid in local currency. No, no, he's a financier and he's laughing. And you know, he knows very well what was happening. So exactly, then, I mean, there's a no, risk so, premium for so investing we're not, in Africa. we're not helping each other. We're not, help, we're not defending our position. If, if, if we are supporting each other, we wouldn't have been in such a situation. And, and this is, I did not talk about African countries supporting other African countries in securing their energy. Because this is another thing, but we, we st let's first start with, 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 the, with the countries that they own resources and they don't use it, they export it and they don't have energy. Let's start with these countries. And then the next step would be to secure energy for other countries through African countries. Exactly. And, and then the rest we will give it to you with no problem. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Being a staunch African through and through, I believe that we should come first. 
Let's talk about the African continental free trade area and whether this will finally shift the needle and get us working together, perhaps, I know, Fola, we were chatting earlier before we came to stage, and there are many elements that are referred to as low-hanging fruit, one being no visas across the continent, free movement of goods, services, and people. But I want to talk about energy. Is this not something that the African continental free trade area can fundamentally shift with political will that we work together for the 600 million people who don't have access to energy on the African continent to ensure that we utilize our natural gas reserves to plug the gap. Just I would like to add on the number of 600, 600 million, they don't have access to electricity. And 900 million, they don't have access to clean cooking. So Got it. This exactly. Is just to You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I certainly think that this must be a critical front burner item in terms of what we can do with a continental free trade zone. Um, but it's, imp it's important not to burden um, the idea of a continental free trade zone with you know, much more than what it can do. Uh, and I'll use you know, a practical example. If you think about the electricity market in Africa, you already have sort of regional uh, electricity uh, markets, certainly in South Africa, you have you know, SAPP, which has been very successful, by the way, in uh, moving uh, electricity from parts of the continent where there's surplus to parts uh, where there's a deficit. Uh, with, with you, you, you've, have you been to South Africa lately? <laughs> well, but, but there's not enough, you, you see. Not, en not enough. We're probably looking at eight hours of load shedding on a rolling basis so, at the so, moment. So I'd love them to bring so, it back to South Africa, help help South Africa no, first. No, I mean, you, you make a good, the, the next point which I'm going to make is that even though we've been successful to some degree in moving energy from one place to another, there's just not enough energy overall, right? And so we need to produce multiples uh, of the amount, like even if we were able through after, and you, you, you've made my point essentially, to move gas from one place to another, there is still a deficit across the, the, the entire continent. Uh, and so there's a significant amount of investment that needs to go into uh, in, So into I just want to drive, supplies. Fola, you said, and, and Henry, I'm coming to you, but you said the African continental free, I'm trying to offer up solutions here. You said let's not overburden AFCFTA. So you tell me where we start with this agenda, because I'm happy to make sure it's verbalized and we get some commitment, but where do we start? I think the answer is in what you have in Egypt, what you have in Algeria, what you have in Morocco. And I think he laid it out very elegantly, right? Which is, in order for a market to be properly functional, you must meet your, your domestic needs, and then you can export. Uh, the challenge, you know, to, to debate him a little bit, is that you're dealing, uh, in, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, with countries that have significant fiscal stress. That's one thing. Right. And so they, we do need those exports very, very desperately uh, of, of, of gas resources. The other point is the point Henry made earlier. A significant, I, I believe it's a third uh, of all of the gas that is being produced in Africa is associated gas. So it's associated, it's intricate, intricately linked with, with oil production. Uh, and so you have to take that into, and, and that's how it's been financed. Folks have financed it because they believe that you know, we can market the oil very readily and then the gas, then the gas. Is, is a bonus on, on top. So we, we, in, t in terms of solutions, one thing that is already going on in Nigeria is an active government effort to create a local market for gas. And creating a local market means creating the value chain, right? the various counterparts that need to exist in the value chain, the infrastructure, right? the storage infrastructure for cooking gas, there's bottling plants, uh, there's uh, retail infrastructure that is required. So there's a whole ecosystem that is needed, that has been ignored for many years, that the government of Nigeria, to their credit, are making, and we're working with them on this, making a very serious effort to catalyze that local market, because if you don't have a local market of ready buyers, you're not going to be able to get the investment upstream. So are we saying then, Henry, that we take the example of what the Nigerian government is doing in terms of creating that local market, and we replicate that formula across the continent? It's a good idea that the government is doing, um, and it's look, looking like it's working. There is one thing I do want to say that we need to keep in mind. 
We're dealing with human beings here. Politicians, they can get greedy. Foreign exchange. Foreign exchange. Very important to short-term politicians. Very true. When you have elections, funny things are being done. For example, I go back to Egypt. Everything you said is true. But recently, Egypt realized that, hmm, if I took 15% of my electricity, my energy, if I cut it by 15%, in other words, not the homes, not the heating or cooling, the shopping malls, just reduce it by 15%, make it available to Europe, I get half a billion dollars extra in windfall. You're going to get things like this. How I would say more often than not, though. Unfortunately. I mean, that's the reality. So you have two spectras. On one hand, Egypt have, have got it right. But they realize they can get a bit more. But I guess if they juggle it correctly, they probably will. On the other hand, as well, I correctly mentioned, you've got Nigeria, who is starting from, they're starting from where they shouldn't be. But they'll get there. But there are certain things that need to be done. If you go to Saudi Arabia, the largest field in the, in the world, Garam Field, um, Gawa Field, I'm sorry, the lifting cost, in other words, for oil. I'm referring to oil because, for once, gas, or the lack of gas, is driving oil prices. In the past, it was lack of oil that drove gas prices. It's the other way around now, at least in Europe. In Gawar Field, <coughs> lifting costs are in single digits. Six, seven dollars. If you and I took space to get oil out of the ground, the production we get versus OPEX, single digits. Oil prices are north $85 now, and it costs them less than $10 to produce that oil. You come to places where it shouldn't cost that high. In some countries, I won't mention, it's over $60, 60 sometimes $70. So the margins are small. So things like um, not having companies or people who want to invest in the country become their own local governments is critical. What do I mean by that? I want to invest, I have to build my own road to get to the site I want to drill or get gas. I have to put my own electricity. I have to import everything. I have to go through very we inefficient structures. We know this, the structure. governments don't create enabling environments for <coughs> private investors. Is that what you're saying? Yes, so it's important for everything we describe here. If you don't create the enabling environment, it becomes too expensive. From a Sahara Group perspective, you operate in 42 countries globally. Correct. Where is your investment welcome when you look at the African continent? To be, to be sincere, um, Nigeria. The company started from Nigeria, grew na from Nigeria, and has kept its connections with government after government, which is important in Africa. Very current and uptight. In other words, they know the political wins, and so they're not afraid of investing. They're not afraid of making long-term commitments because they know at the end they can make long-term rewards. Should it be like that? Most companies can't operate like that. They shouldn't have to operate like that. So as a company, yes, Nigeria would be the place they can, but as, in terms of ease of doing business, it's the Middle East. Adli, let's look now. Sahara so Group will go and invest when they find that they can sell their products, and they will not sell it locally. Probably they will sell it, sell it to the international market, because if you want to sell it locally, you will not be able to secure your payment and you will never be able to get a debt. Am I wrong? So this is the problem. We will have to solve this issue. But, we but will Taka, have to solve let's that look at Taka Arabia and how you Taka, look at the, the continent. Taka, is there no opportunity? Taka, Taka Arabia is investing in the, in the utilizing of the resources in the country itself or in, in the region. So, so the problem, this is the problem we are facing. If we had a client, an international client that will pay, that will pay in, in, in foreign currency, we would have 100 lenders waiting at the door to give us the money. But the problem that we're selling them for locals. So when you come to locals, they will ask you for the guarantees. So unless we solve this, and this is, this is for TACA, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the investment for in, uh, in, in natural gas, for the investment in renewable as well. We know that all the countries in Africa, they need the renewable energy. If we had renewable energy, we, we need electricity. We would have sold the gas to Europe or to, or to whomever need the, the natural gas. We just need electricity for, for, for people to utilize it. It's not logic that today, see, 300 Tanzania, 300, it, it, it was a report, I read it recently, 300 Tanzanian consumption of electricity equal to one 
in, in the United States. One person in the United States utilizes electricity equivalent to 300 Tanzania. Is it, is it fair? The video games, I will not tell you, the video games consumption of electricity in the United States equal to the total generation capacity in Nigeria. Is it logic? Not at all. It's, there's no logic to it whatsoever. But, you know, we talk about renewables. We, we, and need, this is where we, need, we need to find a solution for... We, we need to... The, the good thing, when I see here uh, every financier uh, 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 joining Africa Investment Forum, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good sign. But we need to take an action. So, so I want to also table another solution. We've got oil... We've got... Obviously, we, we want to move from your traditional dirty, dirty fossil fuels, so your coal, your oil, natural gas seen as this transition fuel. You refer to renewables. I mean, renewables are still far off the storage element, which means that in Africa, that's not going to solve our energy issues at night. It's all, the energy, so we need to have natural gas to supplement renewals as we transition. Exactly. This, that is maybe if, if we need to give natural gas for you, I don't mind. Let's give them the natural gas. But at least the $300 billion funds, they will reach $500 by by, per year by 2030. Give us part of, uh, of this uh, investment, and then we will give you the gas. That's we where just, we started. I said, we, let's we do that. Electricity. We want infrastructure funding. We just, we, th there, was, there was a very nice initiative I heard once. Let's, let's, let's gather all the finances together, make one PPA, okay, that is accepted by everyone, and then, and then to utilize this PPA, for, for, and, and it should be accepted Power by, purchase agreement. Yes, power purchase agreement. That should be accepted by the lenders, okay, when I have this... Uh, but wait, wait, wait. Okay, because we've only got, we're gonna, this is the solution now. You know, I'm okay. big into my solutions. Okay. So now we're getting one PPA, PowerPoint, I mean, Power Purchase Agreement. But who is doing this? Is it AFC, FTA? How are we going to get one? It should be all the lenders together, they would reach an agreement that they all accept it. What, so, what do we mean about all the lenders? Are we talking about um, your multi, multilateral Bank, African development? African development. So, Africa Exim Bank, Africa Development Bank, all Africa the people 50, that underpin all, all the organizers of Africa Investment Forum. Got it. They should gather to, together, sit, have one PPA uh, written that is accepted by everyone so we do not start because we pay the, where, when we financed a $50 million, uh, a $75 million investment in renewable, we had to get lawyers to make a PPA that we paid for the lawyers $500,000. I like for, this. For, I like for, this. For one project. So it's an additional cost that we don't need. Why? Because it was a requirement of the lender in order to give us the money to get a certain lawyer who will prepare the PPA in order to be accepted. So Africa Finance Corporation is one of the entities behind mm -hmm. the Africa Investment Forum, and that along with Africa Export Import Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, we've got uh, the Trade and Development Bank. Mm -hmm. You're gonna take this forward, so, Fola? Uh, so th this is a historical problem, actually, that, that is, you know, I don't wanna miss what is very important in, in what he said, but it's not standardized uh, PPAs, right? That's a problem that used to exist. That's not the problem today. The problem today is, is something else you said, which is that you know, banks are unwilling to finance projects that are for domestic consumption. And why is that? Because most of the off-takers domestically are not credible. Uh, and I also don't want to miss, uh, and, and who are the off-takers? The, the electricity utilities, you know, the even- Most of them across the continent are bankrupt. Most of them across the continent are not, are not uh, credit worthy. Uh, and there's a solution in that, and it's part of what AFC is advocating and certainly going to be advocating at COP uh, what, next week, which is, you know, we need to start thinking and we need to start implementing innovative financing solutions. Financing solutions that require support from the West, uh, you know, a just transition is not just something that you, you say. It's something that has to be backed with capital because the kinds of guarantees that financiers require. You know, the funding is available. No, both, but, but follow again, I mean, and internationally. for decades, we've been having this conversation about innovative financing solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally. Well, it's the, it's the only way that you're going to be able to catalyze both local uh, and international capital to support investments that are So we know the solution, but I want to understand the catalyst to get there. 
If we've been talking about it for 10 years, what is this catalyst that at COP, for instance, I'll see you in, in Sharm El Sheikh, I look forward to interviewing you there, and, but what is this catalyst? We know the West needs to contribute. We are missing $100 billion on an annual basis in terms of the just transition, so everybody speaks about it, but it's not being put into action. Henry, you've got the final word, and you're going to have to wrap this up and bring us to a close with the solution. It's not one solution. There are many forms of a solution. But one thing I do want to say is that uh, time is of essence here. You listen to, look at all the African markets and everything we've said, we've covered about six or seven countries. The market is to the EU generally. Yes, Mozambique maybe has a market, which should have a market to Asia. Um, Egypt has a bit, but the EU companies, Totals, Shells, they dominate, which is fine. If you look at the EU, they are moving from fossil fuel. It is true what's happening in Russia has slowed them down a bit. Well, Germany is now looking at coal. Germany goes back and forth. If you lived in Germany 20 years ago, you had three choices, coal, gas, nuclear. Nuclear was by far the cheapest, and I took it. They're going back to that. But nevertheless, assume Russia didn't happen. Eventually, things will get solved there. Two years, things will get back to where we were three years ago. In other words, if the trend of the EU is moving like they plan to move, in 40 years, they'll not be buying what we have today. In other words, we have about 40 years, 50 years, to monetize what we have. To monetize what we have, we have 50 years. We have less than 50 years to look at everything we have in the subsurface and make as much money as we can to develop our infrastructure. We have 50 years for the banks to look at us to ask, okay, this investment, what is the weakness? Security. I think you're being too gracious with 50 years. <laughs> well, I'm referring to this oil and there's gas. They're, they're separate trains. But nevertheless, we were told 35 years. I'm assuming the war in Russia has added five years. So let's say 40 years. We have a very short time window to solve this. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm making. And we're definitely not going to solve it on the stage today. But thank you so much for debating. And I think it's been relatively robust. Thank you so much for your time. I know uh, those of you that are still in the audience really appreciate your time. It is late in the day. Just a reminder to our panelists that we have been streaming live here at the Africa Investment Forum. Uh, thank you to Henry Menkiti, Chief Operating Officer of the Sahara Group, Fola Fagbule, Deputy Director, Head of Financial Advisory at the Africa Finance Corporation, and Adli Kafafi, who is the Vice President of Africa and New Ventures at Taka Arabia. Thank you so much. Thank you.